Good morning, everybody. This is another edition of the Pass Ball Show once again. This is another edition of the Pass Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com, as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. A ton of stuff we're going to get into today, and then let's be honest, this is you know the interactive show, so I want to know what's on your mind in the world of baseball, sports, and unifying America. Um, you know, we've hit some of the uh, the more touchy topics over the course of the week. So we've discussed uh, Le'Veon Bell. We've discussed, you know, Kaepernick in a Nike commercial. And, you know, th those are things that I think will continue to have momentum towards them. And it's not, it's not like either one of those situations, particularly the Kaepernick situation, is extremely interesting. But we take advantage of... You know, as, as somebody like me that does a talk show, as anybody on the radio or the television does, on the polarizing aspects of topics as they apply not just to sports, but apply to real life. We talk about current events. We talk about, unfortunately, politics. And once again, I'm not going to voice any opinions in regards to politics because I think what they are is they're just opinions. Opinions that people have and opinions that people feel the need in some cases to overly express and we live in a society that we treat politics as if they're our girlfriend or our boyfriend when we're 15, 16, 17 years old. And listen, a lot of us have been in this situation, whether you're a girl, whether you're a guy and you're dating somebody, but they seem to be a little too edgy, maybe a little over the top, maybe a little bit tough or have that bad boy or that bad girl image, and we feel that there's some power that we have within ourselves that we can bring out the good or the nice in that people. And that's the way that we handle our politics today. And the best advice I could give is your opinions are great, but don't judge people based off of what they feel, if it's that much different than you. There's a lot of reasons that people have beliefs. There's a lot of reasons that people look at things a certain way and not one person could ever relate to another in regards to, you know, the, the feelings about an issue. There's reasons that people believe differently than you. So respect that. But the first topic I wanted to get into today, and I'll throw out the phone number in case anybody's interested, 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. Anything that's on your mind in a world of baseball, sports, and unify in America, the word immediacy is something, and I'm not going to give myself credit, I'm not the first person to have ever thought about this idea, but I know it was something that I pushed for as early as 2012. And I think in a digital age that we live in right now, there's so much more that exists for us, there's so much more in regards to opportunities to get information out to people quicker, and not just through tweets, not just through social media, but from you know differences in opinion based off of things that immediately happen. Um, if anybody's out on the East Coast, we obviously have the the hurricane Florence, which is you know has hit certain areas already. is probably going to make its way up to the Northeast within the next 24 to 48 hours. So there is a reaction over, all right, is it going to cause damage? Are people going to be hurt? And people are going to want to hear right now, how is it? They don't want to wait till their 6 o'clock news. They don't want to wait for their favorite radio or TV program. Now, how it applies to the world of sports is news breaks all the time. And I could go back to June 1st of 2012, where I, I felt I had my first opportunity to report something or discuss something that immediately happened. And I was Johan Santana's no-hitter, the first no-hitter in the history of the New York Mets organization. And I remember being at work at the time, you know, having to work a later shift and being able to obviously follow the game a little bit on my phone, but most importantly, be in my car for the last inning, which Johan Santana, if I'm not mistaken, was the first Mets pitcher, not named Tom Seaver, to bring a no-hitter into the ninth inning. So as that game was, was happening, there obviously was a lot of emotions because Mets fans had never seen a no-hitter 
in the history of their franchise. Now, when this game ends, it's around 10, you know, gets to around 11 o'clock and there's still reaction to it. I was able to take to the airwaves and discuss the significance of what had just happened. A team that had not seen a no-hitter in 50 years, where there was Twitter accounts that were put out there for the sense of mocking the fact that this team had never accomplished something as simple as a no-hitter. You know, where 28 teams out of the 30 had thrown no-hitters. And of course, to this day, the San Diego Padres have still never been on the side of one. They did get their first cycle a couple of years ago when Matt Ken accomplished that feat. So, you know, the immediacy of something is something that we could all take advantage of in, in a, the world that we live in right now because that's what people want. People have seen it come to them before. People could follow their social media feeds and know if something is going on. If there's breaking news, we get it on the dime. We don't have to wait for it to get to the big networks and to find the right person to report it at the right time. You know, we're not waiting for the 11 o'clock news or in some cases during the day for the six o'clock news. You know, we can, you know, elaborate and discuss things right on the spot. And I've seen a lot of different other forums, obviously people that are well, well more accomplished than I am have started to take into that idea as well. And I think it's a very good one. The ability to discuss something as it's happening. Like I said about the 2012 on June 1st, no hitter by Johan Santana, to be able to take a series of calls from New York Mets fans, people that were very emotional, people that had followed the Mets since 1962, people that were maybe a little bit younger than that and have been Mets fans as far as they could possibly go back, you know, realize the significance of what Johan Santana did and to simply sleep on it and wait until the next morning when you got, you know, morning radio or, you know, sports talk on ESPN to discuss it, I think was a little bit or would have been a little bit too much or too long of a wait. So let's let's all work together and take advantage of the opportunity that we have to be able to discuss, thing, discuss things as they are going on. You know, the me, immediacy. Now, the past ball show is going to continue to do that. You know, we're using the mornings, we're using sometimes in the afternoon, sometimes in the evenings, just to keep a randomness as far as the different times that we're going on. I'm not a big fan of broadcasting while games are going on. I think that's something that, you know, for me, I, I'd rather watch the games. I'd rather not be discussing things and then clicking on scores of the games and say, yeah, it's, you know, three, two reds in the bottom of the seventh as we're speaking, because I want my material to be more, you know, less time sensitive and more archivable, or that you could go back and look at it and say, hey, this is the day that John Kelly talked about this. This is the day that he broke this down, and it wasn't extremely time sensitive. It's worth it to listen, you know, a couple months down the road, even a couple of years down the road, and hopefully long after I'm gone. When I'm no longer on this earth, people can go back to my programs through many different forms and hopefully listen back and, you know, at least get an opinion about what it is that I'm talking about and what it is that I'm doing. And, you know, we, we live in a world, obviously, where so many different things are changing before our eyes. And we live in a world where there's so many different, you know, views that we have on different things that are going on. And all those views are important. Every single one of us that has an opinion should have the right to be able to put it out there. Now, I don't have to agree with it. You know, we could argue, we could debate opinions. You know, I can tell you that I, I, I think your opinion in this particular instance is silly, but it doesn't hide from the fact that you have the right or the ability to have the opinion. Now, I think we should do a better job in making sure that we have things available all the time. And that's what the Passball Show is gonna to continue to bring to the table. Uh, starting next week, we'll bring in some different guests. I'll announce the guests, you know, kind of on the fly. Uh, I don't wanna say, hey, you know, in two weeks we're gonna have this person, and in a week we're gonna have that person. Maybe if it's within a day or so, and I got something set, I'll let people know about it. But you know, we're going to have you know certainly a lot of guests over the course of the next month as we do have the phone lines back. And once again, a reminder: the number. If you're interested, you want to be part of the program: seven three two three six four thirty five ninety eight at seven three two three six four three five nine eight. So, first thing we're going to do today, since it's the Friday show, obviously football. You got it on Sunday. You got it on Monday. And you definitely 
are starting to feel the flow of the regular football fans who, you know, love football all year round, but get their blood flowing and get excited as the season is, is upon us. Every team, no matter where you are or where you were last year, has the opportunity to do great things, has the opportunity to, you know, potentially win their division, maybe make a run in the playoffs. And all you have to do is look back at last year. And then last year, look back at the year before. And remember teams that were in the playoffs two years ago that didn't make the playoffs last year. Teams that were nowhere close to the playoffs two years ago that made the postseason last year. And you know that the parity exists in the National Football League and it's a lot different than most other sports. Well, the lack of parity obviously exists in the NBA. We're gonna you know, table that for another discussion. You know, Major League Baseball, it's kinda in the middle. You have some teams, and we'll talk about it a little later in the program today, about you know the possibility of some teams that weren't expected to be postseason contenders this year, and can they pull it off? A couple of them are in better situations than others, but the National Football League, you got 32 teams, and I understand the Cleveland Browns. You know they've had a, a tough time over the last several years. Really, have had a tough time since they have gotten back into the NFL after their team left to go to Baltimore, and they didn't have a team for a couple of years. And the NFL granted them an expansion team and made it a continuation of the, the old NFL team that was winning championships in the 1950s with Jim Brown. But for the most part, I mean, you see a team like Jacksonville, you see a team like Buffalo last year, teams that had struggled over the course of the past decade getting back in the playoffs. And that's a sign that just about anybody does have the ability, if they could play some good football, build some momentum over the course of the season, and maybe get off to a surprising, you know, five and two or a six and three start as you go down to the stretch of the second half of the year. And we can talk about possibilities of just about anybody getting into the postseason. So without further ado, we'll get into the picks for this week. Last year, last week, I'm sorry, uh, we had a positive week. We ended up picking five games, which we'll pick again this week. I picked all Sunday games last week. We'll see how it ends up working out. I picked the Browns, who ended up tying the Pittsburgh Steelers, and of course I won based off of points. The Carolina Panthers over the Dallas Cowboys and the Kansas City Chiefs over the Los Angeles Chargers. The two games I lost on, I did take the Giants and against the Jacksonville Jaguars. I thought it would be close enough where the Giants could win you know, even if they lost, it could be a one-two point game. And I, I felt good about the Giants coming into week one, a lot to prove. I thought they played a good game, not a great game. And the Jacksonville defense ended up winning in the end. And that weird game between the Tennessee Titans and the Miami Dolphins in Miami with the two, two and a half hour, uh, whatever weather delays, whatever they want to call it, lightning delays, rain delays, I don't know. You know, I didn't expect to see that happen as often in a National Football League as we do in 2018, but uh, I discussed it earlier in the week, and I'm not going to talk about that again. But the Miami Dolphins end up beating the Tennessee Titans. So week number one, we were 3-2. and two. That's the record that we sit at right now. We're hoping to build on that as the past Paul show puts up picks for week two of the National Football League. So the first game that we are going to pick today, and I'm, I'm kind of, I gotta be honest, sometimes we, we feel like things happen in week number one and we overreact to them. And the natural reaction after you get burnt, after you start believing that teams are as good as they are in week one, and you watch and see that they're nowhere near the team that they were in week one and week number two, I'm actually believing in some of the teams that performed well in week number one in a National Football League. So the first game I'm going to take starts at 1 o'clock p.m. on Sunday. The New York Jets are at home playing the Miami Dolphins. And, you know, the Miami Dolphins got a win in their first week, a weird, you know, game, weird circumstances. Uh, Marcus Mariota, amongst many players from the Tennessee Titans, getting hurt over the course of that game. I felt the Titans were the better team, but listen, you know, sometimes it's a matter of when you play somebody as opposed to who it is that you're playing. So the Dolphins come into this game one and zero, and I think that's a bad thing for them, and that's actually a worse thing for them than it is for the New York Jets. The Jets, a 48 to 17 win over the Detroit Lions on Monday night, a little bit of a short week playing Sunday at one o'clock, but 
if the Jets were playing anybody else, uh, you know, perhaps a, a good team that lost in week one, I, I would say buyer beware. But I'm looking at the Dolphins, and I can see this being more of a letdown for the Dolphins than it is for the Jets, because the Dolphins come into this game with the thought, hey, if we can somehow win this game, we'll be 2-0, and zero, and nobody was picking us to do anything this year. Remember what I mentioned a couple minutes ago about every team having an opportunity to, to succeed in the National Football League? You get off to a good start, you start building upon your own momentum, and I think Miami's going to believe this. I think they believe they could come in to New York like they've done in the past, and they've done over the past several years, beat the, and beat the Jets. I, I look at Sam Darnold. I think he learned a lot throwing that pick six on his first pass in the Monday night game against the Detroit Lions. Obviously, that defense is playing very well. And I just think from a matchup advantage standpoint, it's something that I believe in the New York Jets. And the fact that they're only given three points at home, I think it's a game that they can win by four or more. So I believe that's that's a game that I'm going to gravitate towards. First game, week number two, New York Jets minus three against the Miami Dolphins. Second game, um, going to go with a game that I'm believing in for this reason. Now, I look, I look at the Atlanta Falcons, and there's just something up about them. Now, they have, obviously, the star players, Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley. You know, you got the duo running back with Freeman and Coleman. From an offensive standpoint, they're going to be able to put, put up points. Um, they don't scare me defensively like a New Orleans does, as far as just the ability to give up a ton of points. I think their defense is good, but not great. But I was watching them last week, and I understand it's week one. You know, you're trying to get a lot of a rust off. But something didn't you know, gear me towards believing that the Atlanta Falcons are back, or at least to the level where they were a couple of years ago when they made it to the Super Bowl and had that 28-3 lead and lost to the New England Patriots. But it, I told you right off the bat that one of the teams I like this year is Carolina. And Carolina won last week against Dallas. Dallas is a little bit of a disappointing team, and things may get a little worse for them before they get better. But I like the Panthers on the road here, playing the Atlanta Falcons. I like the fact that the Dolphins, I mean, I'm sorry, the Falcons are favored by five and a half points. I think that gives me a little wiggle room if the Falcons end up pulling off the game late with, let's say, a touchdown or a field goal in the final seconds, which could happen. But I think the Panthers can win this game outright. So game number two is the Carolina Panthers giving five and a half, or getting five and a half, against the Atlanta Falcons in Atlanta. So game number three, I'm going to take the Sunday Nighter, which is going to feature the New York Giants at the Dallas Cowboys. And, you know, think about it this way. The Giants are favorited. Now, favorited for a reason, because the a lot of people have kind of soured. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the Dallas Cowboys are actually favorited in this game. So the, the reason that I'm going to jump on this right off the bat is the point spread. The, fa the fact that the Giants are getting three points in Dallas, which normally wouldn't seem like that much of a surprise. But I tell you, I believe the Cowboys got all sorts of issues offensively. I don't think they're going to be able to score a lot of points. If we were going to talk about the key to this game for the New York Giants or their best ability to pull it off and win, and even their record at 1-1 one and one and send the Dallas Cowboys to 0-2, and two, would be the possibility of them stopping the Dallas offense. And I think the Giants' defense, though, it's not 100% perfect. I think we'll have no problem stopping the Cowboy offense. So you look at the Giants and their weapons. I understand they were a little underwhelming in their performance against the Jacksonville Jaguars last week. But not, not to a point where I, I think anybody should be alarmed. I think this is going to be a coming out party for Saquon Barkley. Odell Beckham looked good last week. You, know, you got Ingram and Shepard. And I know Shepard's uh, you know, a little hurt. You know He may not play. I don't know. But I, I do believe the Giants are going to come away in this game. And the fact that they're getting three points, I think, is almost a joke. I think the Giants will win this game outright and probably win it by 10 or more points. So game number three, the New York Giants plus three at Dallas. The last two games, I think I'm going to be doing a little bit of a stretch here. And it's going to be a little bit of a guess on my end. 
and maybe I'm taking a little bit of a chance taking each one of these two games. But, you know, I was looking at a lot of games and was thinking about what games I should touch and what games I shouldn't touch, which games were a little bit scarier to even deal with. Now, I look at the Los Angeles Rams, who are at home against the Arizona Cardinals, getting 13 points. You know, that's a game that you look at and you're like, wow, you know what, maybe I should jump on that. But then I looked at the Arizona Cardinals defense last week, and it's not very good. And the Rams have the ability to put up 30, 40, even 50 points in a game like they did a couple times last year. So that, that's a game I don't want to touch. Another game I don't want to touch is New Orleans, favorited by nine at home against the Cleveland Browns. Everybody was looking at the New Orleans Saints saying the easiest game to pick last week was the Saints against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And the Buccaneers end up scoring 48 points on them in a game where 88 points were scored total. And I don't think, you know, you can really look at the Saints and believe that they're going to be as good as we thought they were going to be. I still got the Saints getting to the playoffs, but I'm not going to touch them given nine points against the Cleveland Browns. I need to see that vintage, you know, Drew Brees, you know, New Orleans offense with a good enough defense to keep the opposition from scoring before I'm going to start to believe that the Saints are back. So I'm not touching that game. Last game I'm not touching is New England at Jacksonville, which is actually a pick -em. And, you know, I think Jacksonville could hold off in a regular season game and beat the Patriots at home. Could also see the Patriots win. So that's another scary one to touch. And finally, I forgot to even mention this one, Minnesota at Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers maybe being a game-time decision. You know, I don't, I don't want to involve myself there. Is Aaron Rodgers playing? Is Aaron Rodgers not playing? And if he plays, is it, is it a decoy just to get him on the field to create, you know, a different type of game plan as it would if Deshaun Kaiser was the quarterback there? I, I don't know. I want to stay away from that game. So it leads me to pick a couple games that normally I wouldn't take over the course of a regular week. And the first game is Tampa Bay at home against the Philadelphia Eagles. And that, I think, would probably fit the build of a scary game to pick because you got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers coming off of a ridiculous win against the New Orleans Saints, one in which very few people expected to happen. Philadelphia Eagles held off the Atlanta Falcons, and I'm going to go upset route because I do believe that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers could put up back-to-back -back wins to start this season. Now, normally I wouldn't say that, but I was very impressed with what I saw out of Ryan Fitzpatrick, not just his performance, but the cohesiveness with that offense. It seemed like Mike Evans and Deshaun Jackson and you know the guys around him, the offensive line, seemed to respond to Fitzpatrick in a way that they didn't respond to Jam Jameis Winston last year. And I do believe there's some cohesion there. The Buccaneers' defense is not good, but I don't think it's horrible. And I think in a big spot, you could expect them to stop somebody in a big spot. And I think sometimes we tend to just look at what happened last year and what happened last week and kind of overreact to it. Like the Philadelphia Eagles are going to start the season 12-0 and just because they won a Super Bowl last year. It may not happen. Listen, I'm not saying that the Eagles aren't going to make it to the playoffs. But can they lose a game on the road? You know, coming off of the, the homecoming, the raising of the banner, their first Super Bowl win, you know, that championship moment, like Mike Tirico, you know, mentioned about 12 times on NBC. I never heard of a championship moment. I understand it's the celebration of winning the Super Bowl last year, but he, he used that term championship moment like it was something that everybody was supposed to resonate with and understand. But I'm going to go with the upset here. And I think the Tampa Bay Bucks can keep this game close. Um, I think it's going to be a very low-scoring game, contrary to what you saw last week with the Bucks and the Saints. Um, the Eagles' defense is obviously very good, so I don't expect to see a ton of points going on the board. But I could see the game being tight and the unexpected quarterback of Ryan Fitzpatrick running the Bucks down the field and getting that late score. And the Bucks coming out, you know, with a point win or a two-point win or something like that. They're getting three at home. That's going to be my upset of the week. Tampa Bay plus three at home against the Philadelphia Eagles. And the last game I'm going to pick is, to me, probably the easiest one. Now, I said, you know, looking at the Giants, I thought they could win by double figures. 
Um, I look at the Jets, and I think that they're much better than Miami, and I think Miami's hurting themselves or could potentially hurt themselves coming off of a win in week one as opposed to a loss. But I look at two teams that lost last week and two teams that lost in different type of fashions. The San Francisco 49ers played a very tough game against the Minnesota Vikings. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo's first loss as a starting quarterback in the National Football League. I think as the 49ers move forward, you'd be happy that he got that out of his way. He didn't want to start out 3-0 and zero or 4-0 and zero and then not know how to respond to being a losing quarterback in the National Football League. So the fact that it was against the Vikings, a very good team, I thought the 49ers played well. They got a home game this week against the Detroit Lions, and there were very few teams in the National Football League that looked any worse in week one than the Detroit Lions did. And they were bad. They looked almost uncompetitive against the New York Jets. That third quarter was, was a monstrosity. It was disgusting. It was a terrible performance. Not only that, but the body language you get from seeing the coach and the players, it doesn't look like Matt Patricia has won that team over yet. So if I'm going to expect one game to happen a certain way and one game to be a blowout, it's going to be the 49ers who are bouncing off of a tough loss against the Minnesota Vikings, a team that they played very well against, but unfortunately fell a little bit short against a Detroit Lions team that is going to have to search for its soul, is going to have to search for anything that it has within itself and see if they are going to be competitive this year. This was a team that had a winning record last year. This was a team that fell just a little bit short of getting to the postseason. A uh, team with a star quarterback, a defensive-minded coach, and we're going to find out if this coach maybe is a little too far over his head, maybe taking advantage of the opportunity in New England and the spotlight and being a coach on a team that is good year in and year out. We'll see over the course of the next couple of weeks where the Detroit Lions sit, but I think it's going to be a pretty easy one. 49ers getting six at home or favored by six at home against the Detroit Lions. So the five picks for week number two, the Jets minus three at home against Miami, the Buccaneers, plus three at home against the Philadelphia Eagles in the upset of the week. The Carolina Panthers, plus five and a half at Atlanta. The New York Giants, plus three in Dallas. And finally, the 49ers, minus six at home against the Detroit Lions. This is the Pass Ball Show, brought to you by JohnPielli.com, as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Going to throw the phone number out there one more time. 732-364-3598. 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. So the last thing I wanted to discuss today is give a, give a little update on what's going on with the baseball playoffs as we're in the middle of the month of September. And if, this, if the season were to end today in the American League, Boston, Cleveland, Houston, Oakland, and the Yankees, And it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that those five teams are going to be getting to the postseason this year. The only dispute at this point is who's going to host the wild card game. The New York Yankees, who have had a lengthier lead for that first wild card spot in the American League, it's down to a game and a half. Actually, it was down to a game before yesterday when the Yankees were off and the Oakland Athletics lost to the Baltimore Orioles. But, you know, we'll see who ends up hosting that game. But it looks like it's pretty... Obvious it's going to be the Yankees and the Athletics in a wild card game. The only other race that could be there, the Oakland Athletics have played very good baseball for you know, all season, but most importantly over the last couple months. have had the ability to move up in the standings. They gained about four or five games on the Yankees in a matter of a week or two. If, if they have that same run and the Houston Astros stumble a little bit, the three-and-a-half game lead that the Houston Astros have, you know, could be a race in the final week. We'll see what happens, but it looks like the American League playoffs are set. Same can't be said about the National League. You got two division races that really haven't been decided at this moment, but also you have a couple possibilities in regards to the wild card. The division leaders, you got the Rockies, you got the Cubs, and you got the Braves, but the Rockies just have a a one-and-a-half game lead over the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Chicago Cubs have a a one-and-a-half game lead over the Milwaukee Brewers. Now, I think we expect to see the Cubs prevail, which they have over the last couple years. 
the Milwaukee Brewers have been getting better. And they're playing good baseball and deserve to get an opportunity to be in the playoffs, which they do at the moment. They're holding on to what looks like a three-game lead over the St. Louis Cardinals for that second wild card spot. So it looks like the wild card spot if the season ended today would go to Milwaukee to host the game against St. Louis. But there seems to be a little bit more of uncertainty that exists in the National League as opposed to the American League. And, you know, it's interesting to see if the Cubs can hold off the Milwaukee Brewers. A couple games that don't go to Cubs way and go to Milwaukee Brewers way will shift the standings a little bit. And you got the Los Angeles Dodgers who, what, for the last, what, four or five years have won the Western Division in the National League. They're down by a game and a half against a good Colorado team, a candidate in Trevor Story that is looking to make a run for an MVP in the National League and that MVP in the NL is still very wide open. We talked about yesterday the AL MVP, and it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that J.D. Martinez is going to get the award in the AL, but there's certainly a lot more competitors or a lot more really good seasons to compare it to as opposed to the National League where you're looking at a Trevor Story, you're looking at a Javier Baez, you're looking at just a couple players, whether it's a Matt Carpenter or somebody else on the peripheries, but you're not looking at anybody that's dominating the sport the way J.D. Martinez is in the American League, the way that Chris Davis is in the American League, the way that Jose Ramirez, Mookie Betts, you know, are doing in the American League. Same thing you can say about Alex Brink, 30 home runs, 50 doubles this year. Trevor Story is having an MVP type of season. He's certainly having a breakout season, looking like he's becoming a young star for the Colorado Rockies. And you know offensively, with guys like Nolan Arenado and Charlie Blackman, they're going to be able to score a ridiculous amount of runs. And even their role players, you know, the guys that don't have the big names. You know, Carlos Gonzalez, obviously had a bigger name years ago, is contributing. Ian Desmond is contributing. And the question you always have with the Colorado Rockies is, are they going to get enough pitching? Is their starting pitching good enough to be able to handle a three, you know, a three out of five series in a divisional round? And we're going to see how that ends up working out. The Rockies, of course, made it to the wild card game last year, lost to the Arizona Diamondbacks, are looking to build upon that this season. Kyle Freeland, very quietly, has had a very good season. Now, in a league that's got Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer and Aaron Nola, some very good performances, it's going to be hard to put Kyle Freeland in the Cy Young candidacy that he probably deserves, or in most years would deserve. He's sitting there with a sub-3 ERA, pitching his home games in Colorado at Coors Field. He's won 15 games, and I understand the value of the, the win stat is not anywhere near what it was about 20, 30 years ago. But this is a guy that's having a very good year. And if there's a game to win for the Colorado Rockies, I trust Kyle Freeland up there with anybody in the National League, whether he's facing the Dodgers or facing any other team in the National League. You know, German Marquez has done pretty well this year. John Gray has been up and down. Gray is the guy that I think a lot of people in Colorado or in Major League Baseball or that study the minor leagues and the drafts and stuff like that for different outlets, it, expect John Gray to become that team's ace. He hasn't done that this year. He certainly has more strikeouts than innings pitched. Uh, but, I mean, I look at Marquez and Freeland, and I think that they're both at this point of the game, at this stage of their careers, as we look at it on September 14, 2018, they give the Rockies a better chance to win than John Gray. So I look at the bullpen, Wade Davis, we know what he can do. He has had a little bit difficulties adjusting to the elements in Colorado. Same thing with Brian Shaw. Adam Adovino has been very good. You know, Scott Olberg has helped them out a lot. I think the key for the Rockies, if they're going to advance in the playoffs or if they're going to hold off the Dodgers and win the National League West is what are they going to get out of Wade, Wade Davis, Brian Shaw, and Jake McGee? Three pitchers that have struggled at many points of the season. Davis's numbers look a little bit better. Shaw's numbers look terrible. Now, McGee's numbers look terrible. These are all guys that have had big moments. And for Davis and Shaw, they've had big moments in a postseason. So they're going to need those pitchers to come up big for them 
down the stretch if they're going to hold the Dodgers off and if they're going to have any chance of advancing in the National League playoffs. Sung Juan O has come over there and he's thrown the ball very well. He's come over from Toronto. He's had a very good season. They're going to they're going to look to try to get anything out of anybody. But you realize, you know, games that come down to the stretch, playoff games, especially in wild card and division series games, comes down to the strength of your bullpen. And I think the Rockies have the pieces to be able to get hitters out late in games, but they haven't performed very well this year. I look at the Arizona Diamondbacks. They need a little bit of a jolt. They need a little bit of a of a kick in a you know what if they're going to be in the race as the season ends up coming down the lines. Of course, St. Louis is playing really well. The Philadelphia Phillies are taking a step backwards. Unfortunately, their Cinderella season looks like it's coming to an end. And that leaves the Atlanta Braves in a position that they are right now. At the moment, 18 games over 500. They've clinched themselves a winning season for the first time in a little bit of a while. I think it's since 2013. You know, this is a team that added some veterans at the trading deadline, pretty similar to what the Philadelphia Phillies did. Obviously, both teams were able to take advantage of the Washington Nationals stumbling this year and the New York Mets being terrible. Um, obviously, you got to like Albies. you got to like Okunia. The veterans on that team, whether it's Nick Markakis, whether it's Ender Enciarte, their big leader, Freddie Freeman. And, you know, you, you, this is a team that I think can probably advance a little bit in the National League. The key for them is going to be their starting pitching. It's going to be the performance of a Mike Fultonevich, who was an all-star this year. Sean Newcomb, who came an out away from throwing a no-hitter this year. It looks like he's come into his own. Julio Tehran, who for the last several years has been their ace, is now on a winning team and may be the most trusted guy to pitch a winner-take-all type of game. Now, I look at their bullpen and, you know, Jesse Biddle, who was a prospect with the Philadelphia Phillies several years ago, has had a good year as a reliever. Um, I don't look at the Braves and say, hey, this is a team that has got that shutdown bullpen. But what they have is a series of pretty good relievers. Biddle, Dan Winkler, A.J. Minter. You know, even Max Fried has helped them out in some long and short relief situations. Shane Carl. Uh, you know, of course, the acquisitions of Brad Brock and Johnny Venters have helped them out a lot. But this is a team that I believe if the game gets late and you're trusting the Braves relievers, I could see a team taking advantage of that. I could see a team like the Cubs or the Rockies, you know, offenses that are stacked one through nine, being able to take advantage of this Atlanta bullpen. So I like the story of the Atlanta Braves. I think they've arrived. There's no reason to say that they're not back next year in the same type of position. I don't think we look at the Braves as rebuilding anymore. And you know, hopefully another week or so. They're going to celebrate their first division title since 2013. And, you know, it's, it's good to see that they've come full circle from a team that had a lot of players, had to ship off a lot of players, went through a rebuilding phase, and has seen it, seen it come back, pretty similar to what the Houston Astros did, you know, in uh, you know 2014 and 2015 as they grew themselves up. I think the Braves are here to stay. Unfortunately, I just don't trust their bullpen enough. And, you know, the overmanaging that happens in Major League Baseball, and I don't know if it's because managers feel like they have to manage so differently, but, you know, you look at guys like Terry Francona, who has seen it work with the Cleveland Indians with the use of his bullpen, Joe Girardi last year with the use of his bullpen, not being afraid to pull Luis Severino after getting a couple outs in the first inning in a wild card game. Managers don't have that trust in their starting pitchers when it comes to the postseason. And I tell you, if the Atlanta Braves are going to have any chance to move past the first round, I think they're going to have their NL East title. They'll have their moment. If they're going to advance past the first round, they're going to need to have some to have some uh, you know success in the postseason. If they're going to do that they're going to need to push their starters a little bit further. And, you know, PNI Hill 2020 is trolling a little bit, you know, and it's pretty cool. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see anybody, uh, you know, with plague out in the sewer, but I did want to acknowledge your contribution to the program. Thanks for having a couple minutes here on the Pass Ball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com. 
But, you know, I'd be concerned about the Atlanta Braves maybe being too cautious with their starters. I think if Brian Snicker is going to have a plan in regards to the to doing something a little bit different than other teams, he's going to need to maximize his starters. He's going to need to push a Mike Fultonavich, a Sean Newcomb, a Julio Tehran, maybe a little bit longer than they would over the course of the regular season. And if that happens, I think the Braves can maximize their 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 talent. Uh, and you know the question is going to be, is Snicker interested in pushing his starters maybe a little bit longer late in the season to get a little more length out of them in a the postseason? Because I, you can't have Fultonavich going three innings and then you go to A.J. Minner and Dan Winkler in the third, fourth, and fifth inning. I think it's a recipe for disaster. I think if you're playing the Rockies, if you're playing the Cubs, you're looking at a couple teams that are just going to pile runs on. And their strength really is Fultonavich and Newcomb with a little bit of Tehran sprinkled in there. So if, if I'm going to go for it, if I'm, if I'm the Braves and I want to make my best chance of representing the National League in the playoffs and maybe moving past the first round, having a chance to play in the NLCS, and maybe if you can win that, get to the World Series, they're going to have to push their starting pitchers. They're going to have to not use the philosophy that's been used in baseball over the past five years. Get a time or two through the batting order from your starter and trust your bullpen. I think the Braves have gotten some success out of their bullpen this year, but I don't trust them in a big spot. I certainly don't trust them to get 15 outs in three out of five games to get past the first round in a National League Division Series. So a little bit of recap of the show today. We talked about um, the word immediacy, and people want immediacy now. People have the opportunity to, you know, hear you right away. And the fact that somebody can come on and broadcast at 2 a.m. after a big moment that happens in a world, not just of sports, but anything that happens in this world, is so much more powerful now than it was years ago. And we need to take advantage of that. We need to have people that are just like, bam, I'm coming on right away to discuss this moment that happened just now. My NFL picks, I'll go real quick through them. I got the Jets against the Dolphins. I got the Bucks over the Eagles. I got the Panthers over the Falcons. Giants over Dallas. And then I got San Francisco over Detroit. So anybody wants to see my picks, they'll be up on my website, johnpielli.com. Feel free, comment. Let me know what's on your mind in the world of baseball, sports, and unified America. National League playoff races, I think, are going to be a little interesting down the stretch. I don't trust the Braves. Um, I do, you know, you look at the Cubs and, you know, from a talent standpoint, seem to be a little superior than the other teams in the National League. Can the Dodgers get in? Can the St. Louis Cardinals continue their magical run they've had since Mike Schilt took over for Mike Matheny? We'll see how that ends up working out. But I hope everybody has a really good weekend. We'll be back with you on Monday. This is the Pass Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.